everyone. Welcome to episode 200 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. What are we on the hunt for? I, I forgot for a second. <laughs> That's what happens when you get 200 episodes old. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. And welcome, everyone. We are so excited to have you here. We have some fun in store. Just you wait to celebrate episode 200. We're going to make you wait to the end, though. <laughs> First, we have some thank yous. Yes, we would like to thank Joyce and Kathy for becoming Patreon members. And we'd love to thank Barb for increasing her patronage. And then Adele sent us a lovely check. Yeah, a reminder that you can also contribute to the Book Cougars outside of Patreon. If that's comfortable for you, feel free to email us at bookcougars at gmail.com if you have questions. Yes, and thank you all. We also want to remind you about our first quarter read-along in our year of reading romance. Indigo by Beverly Jenkins. The Zoom discussion will be on Sunday, March 3rd at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Send us an email if you'd like to be a part of that. And there's also a thread on our Goodreads group about Indigo and then a general thread about romance. Yes. Please come join that conversation. Now, one of the special things we're going to talk about in this episode are our listener top 10 reads of 2023. Thank you to everyone who contributed their top 10s to our handy little form that got spit out into a lovely little spreadsheet and crunched numbers for us. Yes, and we loved your comments as well. We see you. <laughs> we know it was hard. We had to do it too. We also love people who snuck in like series <laughs> as the one of as one way to go, way to beat the system. <laughs> So we will let you know the listener top 10, but we also want to remind you that this will appear on our bookshop.org page. So if you want to go see it there or purchase any of them, feel free. It'll all be in one place. Coming in at number one, Tom Lake by Ann Patchett. Hello Beautiful by Ann Napolitano. Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. The Covenant of Water by Abraham Verghese. Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by James McBride. Yellow Face by R.F. Kwong. I kind of was surprised that Tom Lake was number one. Mm. I really had a feeling it was going to be Damon Copperhead. I just yeah. had a feeling about that, but that ended up coming in third. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So interesting enough, our nine and ten slots, there's a seven-way tie, believe it or not. The Reading List by Sarah Nisha Adams. Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. The Fraud by Zadie Smith. Unlikely Animals by Annie Hartnett. Signal Fires by Danny Shapiro. Absolution by Alice McDermott. And then The Postcard by Annie Barrist. Those were the top 10 listener reads of 2023. Thank you so much, everybody. You know, it grows our TBR. I think all of them are books I've heard of. And some of them I've read, many of them I want to read. So even if I don't get to them, I feel like we get to live vicariously. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, like Tom Lake, that was one I was kind of on the fence about because I have that reactionary thing to when something's really popular, I, I resist it. Seeing it on a bestseller list is one thing. But knowing that our listeners, so many of them love that book. And they're real people. I'm much more likely to read it now this year, I think. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. So exciting to know what you're reading. And we should say there were over 300 books. <laughs> so a lot of books. this is just the top of the top. Yes. I mean, if anybody's interested, we could send you the spreadsheet if you wanted to see all of the books, because there are a lot of just singles out there. I have to say, as a follow up to our top 10 episode with Russell, if you've listened to that episode, we game it out a little bit. Sometimes there's a book we want to put on our list, but we're sure one of the other one is going to put it on their list. So it's kind of playing a little game of chance. <laughs> and I did think Chris was going to put the reading list on hers. So I didn't put it on mine. And so I'm really glad it appeared on the listener top 10. Yes. yes I loved yeah. reading that book. Yeah, I have fond memories. I had sent a copy to my mom. And when I was visiting her, I, right there on her nightside table, it was nice to see. So Chris, what are you currently reading? Well, I'm still procrastinating on the Iliad. <laughs> Picking that up again, though, very soon. I've been dipping in here and there. 
but I am really enjoying a book that did appear multiple times on our top 10 listener list. I'm reading River of the Gods, Genius, Courage, and Betrayal in the Search for the Source of the Nile by Candace Millard. This is a book that came out last year, and I was looking for something adventurous, nonfiction. You know, my go-to has in the past been like John Krakauer, outdoorsy kind of books. And I had heard Candace Miller on another podcast. I think it might have been Bio or Drafting the Past. Those are two nonfiction podcasts that I really enjoy. And I thought it sounded great. And I love ancient Egyptian stuff. And finding the source of the Nile, though, I had no idea that it was such a long time quest for people to find the source of the Nile that like the ancient Greeks were looking for the source of the Nile. So it's really good. And I'll talk more about it next episode. I'm at about the 60% mark right now. Two really engaging guys were on the first expedition that's discussed in this book, Burton and Speck. So more to come on that. What about you? I'm reading The Sicilian Inheritance by Joe Piazza. This is a novel and its pub date is April 2nd, so not too far away. And I heard about this book from another novelist. She wrote about it and it really caught my eye. It's told from two different points of view, two women in different time periods, one in current day and one in the early 1900s. And the current day, the woman is a butcher. I just love that. And she owns a restaurant and the restaurant has failed. Her life is kind of falling apart. And she has this whip smart, just really funny aunt who has passed away. But before she passed away, she said that she wanted her to go to Italy to learn about her aunt's mother. And there's some mystery around her mother. And so she does. So most of the novel takes place in Italy either in the 1900s or current day. So I'm enjoying it because I feel like I'm getting a little vacation at the same time. There's also a mystery involved, though. So it's a real page turner. Again, it's called The Sicilian Inheritance by Joe Piazza out April 2nd. Well, the other book I'm reading is Unmasking AI, My Mission to Protect What is Human in a World of Machines. And this is by Joy Bolam Winnie. I just read the introduction this morning, so this is very new start for me. But she, as a student at MIT, they have a computer lab where they can create anything they want. I guess one of the classes she took, it was actually where they'd read science fiction novels, and then they had to create whatever they wanted to create, something maybe that they've always wanted to create, but it had to be done within six weeks, right, within the time frame of the course. And she was working on this tool that would read your face and transpose other faces on it. And one of the things she quickly noticed was that it wouldn't read her black face. We've heard about that in the news. Facial technology doesn't read darker faces as well. Same thing with photography. And so there she was, this black young woman, working on this project wearing a white mask at MIT. So I really look forward to reading this. I'm really curious about AI. There's a lot of different uses of AI. And one of the things that wigs me out about AI is predictive AI, which can predict what you're going to do. And if I may tell a quick little story, the other day I was driving home from work and I have an Apple phone and I use Siri and I was driving home and listening to 1970s songs and I would just say, hey, Siri, you know, play the Night the Lights Went Off in Georgia by Vicki Lawrence, which was one I was really listening to. And that was probably like the fifth or sixth song. And I was thinking, I didn't say anything out loud, but I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll ask for some Gordon Lightfoot next because he passed away last year. I've always really enjoyed his music. And before I could even get that out, the next song that came on was If You Could Read My Mind And I was like, that is creepy as hell, (laughs) right? So was it the algorithm predicting what I might like, Gordon Lightfoot? Because I'm sure I've listened to those songs all together in a way in the past. Or was it just chance? I mean, I think it was just chance that it was that song from that album. But weird, right? Or can Siri read your mind? Well, that's what I'm thinking, you know? I think it's fascinating. It can be very useful. 
But as Joy Bolam Winnie says in her book, there's so much coding that is inherently racist, gender biased, heteronormative, that a lot of people can be harmed unintentionally. And then there's also bad actors who use things. So more to come on that. That was, again, Unmasking IA. Well, speaking of someone who's not a bad actor, (laughs) (laughs) I'm reading Upstream by Mary Oliver. This is her essay collection. And this is a funny story. I bought this collection the day it came out. I ran to the bookstore and bought it. That was, I don't know seven years ago. I think I remember that 2016. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seven years ago. I rarely run to a bookstore and buy a book. I was so excited about this course, then sat on my nightstand, I didn't get to it. And then when I was going to move to my new house, all I could find was the dust jacket, no book. And so I queried my son Jacob, because I had this slight memory of him picking it up when he came to visit me one time, and he assured me he didn't have the book. Well, lo and behold, y'all, I just was at his house in Colorado, (laughs) sleeping in a room filled with books. And one night I decided to look at the books. And what did I find? (laughs) My copy of Upstream, sans dust jacket. (laughs) It's now back in my possession. So I started at the very end because I noticed that there was an essay entitled Provincetown. Mary Oliver spent a large part of her life living in Provincetown and loved it. I just thought I'd read you a quick little paragraph. It says, A town cannot live on dreams. The change was slow but harsh. The young men and women, boys and girls, left to find work and to build another life. And the town became, not all at once, but steadily, a town of pleasure. People swarmed in on weekends, and they still do, and it will no doubt go on. And there is no blame in this. The town had to find another way to live. It's so generous. You know she was there as an artist when it was much different and really saw the change. And then the very last sentence of the book is, I don't know if I'm heading toward heaven or that other dark place, but I know I have already lived in heaven for 50 years. Thank you, Provincetown. So I thought that was a lovely ending essay. And I'm looking forward to digging in more Upstream by Mary Oliver back in my hands. (laughs) So, Emily, what have you just read? I finished this slim little book on the flight to Colorado. It's called Exact Replica of a Figment of My Imagination, a memoir by Elizabeth McCracken. And it takes place over a period of time, about 18 months, where she is living in France. She is married to the novelist and playwright Edward Carey. So they live a very itinerant lifestyle at this point in their lives and spend a lot of time in France. She becomes pregnant. She has her whole pregnancy there and ends up giving birth to a stillborn baby. So the memoir is about that, but then it's also written at a point in time where about a year and some months later, she's had a healthy baby boy. So it's very reflective on that experience, but you also know that she had another experience that ended up being very happy. But it's got a lot of grief in it, as you might imagine. She also has startling wit. This is very slim. She's a spare writer, but throws in a lot of humor, and I just loved it. The only other book of hers I've read is called The Giant's House, which is one of her novels, and I plan to read more. Again, it's called Exact Replica of a Figment of My Imagination by Elizabeth McCracken. Well, I finished Thirst by Marina Zuzchuk. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. Sorry. It was translated by Heather Cleary. And it originally came out, I think, in 2020 in Spanish. The translation is new. I read an advanced reader copy from NetGalley and Dutton. Thank you both for that. This novel comes out March 5th, so put it on your list. It's really rare, I think, to find a translated vampire story. I mean, I haven't come across a lot of them. I haven't done a search for them online or anything. Perhaps I'll do that. The only other one that comes to mind immediately is Vlad by Carlos Fuentes, who's a Mexican writer, and that's one of my favorite vampire novels. Really great 
reimagining of the Dracula tale there. But Thirst, get back to the book at hand here, is about a female vampire who is ancient. She's lived all of her life in Eastern Europe somewhere, eventually is kind of forced to move along, and she's in Western Europe, and she leaves Germany and gets on a boat that takes her, in the end, to Buenos Aires in like the late 1700s. And she's there for a very long time, trying to survive in this city that's growing and becoming modern. I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but there's weird things happening with time in this book. So again, you know, she's there in the late 1700s, 1800s, 19th century, things are happening. And then the story becomes about a contemporary woman who is dealing with the dying of her mother, the mortality of her mother. Along the way, you get these hints that she has issues with aging. And I think listeners can put those two things together. If you know anything about typical vampire stories, you might have an inkling of what happens with these two women who are living in the same city from very different centuries. I liked it overall. It was a little bit challenging to read at times. And I'm not sure if that was because of the translation or what was happening with time. There was one thing, and I just have to say this because it really grated on me. The character who is alive during contemporary days, she has a surgery where several of her vertebrae are fused together. The description is she wakes up after the surgery in the fetal position in excruciating pain. I don't think it's possible to get in the fetal position when you've had four vertebrae fused. Now, that was the, the biggest one, but there were some small things that made me stop and question maybe what was going on, which is a fun thing in a novel, especially when weird time things are happening. But when it's something like that, it kind of makes me leery. And then there's another scene where she plops down on the couch and it's like somebody with excruciating daily back pain doesn't plop anywhere. <laughs> so maybe, did it make you wonder if it was the translator, maybe like choosing terms that were a stretch? Possibly. That's the kind of situation that makes me wish I could read Spanish because it is curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the translation, you just never know. And I'm always curious when people say, oh, this is such a good translation when they don't speak the language that the book is translated from, how can you tell? Mm -hmm. It might read smoothly and be a great book, but you can't really tell if it's a good translation unless you speak both languages. Right. Yeah. So I would say if you like vampire novels that aren't on the shocking horror side of the thing and that are more about a monster and philosophical questions, you might want to check this one out. So again, that was Thirst by Marina Yuzchuk, I'm going to say. And again, that's coming out March 5th. Well, I finished Tom Lake by Ann Patchett. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm with you readers who chose it as your top. And this is a novel and it takes place in northern Michigan, which was fun for me because that's where my daughter lives, right in Traverse City. I have other family there as well. And it's about a woman and her husband and her family, they're all living on a cherry orchard stuck there at the time of the pandemic. So it's current day. And she is telling her daughters a story about her younger years and being in an actress in a play, Our Town, and dating a man who's become a famous actor. And it's really a mother telling her family a story. And so it's kind of meta, you know, it's a story inside of a story. And I listened to it fully via audiobook, which is narrated by Meryl Streep. You know, I'm a huge fan of Ann Patchett, but I have to say, as far as her novels go, it wasn't my favorite. I tend to like her older novels best, but I did enjoy it. It kept me entertained. And for the first time ever on an airplane, I finished that little short Elizabeth McCracken. And I thought, well, I've got this audiobook. I'm just going to sit on the plane and listen to my audiobook. I don't think I've ever done that. And it was really fun. And as you might imagine, because Meryl Streep is a decorated actor, her voice is beautiful. And she narrated it exquisitely. She also is a mother of three daughters. So I don't know if she felt some 
affinity for the story, you know, as she was reading it, that came through. But it was an interesting story. It was captivating. And Anne Patchett is a great storyteller. So I feel you, listeners, why you chose it as your top. Again, that was called Tom Lake by Anne Patchett, narrated by Meryl Street. Well, I wonder if Anne and Meryl are friends in real life. I might be able to tell you more about that when we're talking about Biblio Adventures. <laughs> All right. Well, the only other thing I read between last episode and today is Behind the Singer Tower by Willa Cather. It's a short story that was published in 1912, and a lot was going on in Cather's life in 1912. That was the year she resigned or left her post as an editor to pursue writing full time. This is a story about a hotel fire, a horrible hotel fire at a very ritzy, fancy hotel in New York City. Then it's told by a person who is a journalist. After the fire, one of the men, there's, I think, five of them go out on a boat into the harbor, the bay there to just get some fresh air and, and get away from the tragedy that they've been looking at for over a day now. So it's like two journalists a politician of some kind, an engineer who is the one who tells the story, and a young doctor who is Jewish. There's a lot of anti-Semitic comments in this short story that reflect how these men are talking. There's a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment as well, because it's basically this engineer telling his story of why he is not friends with this other very prominent engineer it's because the other guy cuts corners in a shady. And so I don't want to give too many spoilers about it. But one of the remarkable things about it is that it's one of the only stories probably that Cather wrote that was like direct social commentary on how corrupt, powerful, wealthy people take advantage of and exploit the poor or immigrants who are coming and doing manual labor so it's really good for that. But it was not a story that later got anthologized during Cather's lifetime. Other stories that she wrote, they do have social commentary, but it's much more indirect and subtle. She doesn't give it to her readers on a platter, which I appreciate. But then a lot of people tend to overlook some things in her books. Like, you know, My Antonia is one that comes to mind is a novel that's so beautiful about the landscape descriptions take people away and the beautiful characters that are described in relationships, they overlook the murder and the attempted rape and the suicides or they forget them. Because I think we tend to see as in life, like fiction, what we want to see. So it was a short story that was a short read, but it made me think about a lot of things, including Cather's biography. So again, that was Behind the Singer Tower by Willa Cather. Well, I continued my short story reading project. I'm doing well in January. <laughs> <laughs> so I happened to um, pick up a copy of Tom Hanks story collection called Uncommon Type, some stories. And I read the story titled, These Are the Meditations of My Heart. And every story in the collection has to do with typewriters. He has a fascination with typewriters in real life. And so this story is about a young woman who goes to a church sale and comes across almost like a toy typewriter, but you can type on it. It's bright red. And inside the typewriter is already a piece of paper and typed on it is these are the meditations of my heart. And the story is about her taking the typewriter home. I think she paid $5 for it, trying to decide what she wants to do with it because no one's using typewriters anymore. And then she realizes that it has some mechanical problems. So she looks for a repair person, finds the repair person who's got this room filled with typewriters, and they start to discuss the purpose of them. It was a really sweet, short short story. I really enjoyed it. And I've not read anything by Tom Hanks. I know the book Cougars librarian Linda Johnson read this collection, she said on Facebook when I posted a picture of it, and really enjoyed it. So that's high praise. The other short story I read was from the collection Old Crimes by Jill McCorkle. 
and I read the title story called Old Crimes. And it's about a young couple who are dating. They decide to take a little trip to an inn. And the woman, Lynn, part of the couple, is taking a creative writing class. And in the creative writing class, they're asked to pick an object and pick a place where that object exists and then imagine a person in that place with the object and then keep imagining different people with the object. And that's supposed to give you an idea of things to write. And so originally she thinks she's going to write about a hat and then she decides the belt would be a better one because there's so many options with a belt. I'm just going to read this little passage. The belt, looping and connecting since 3300 BCE. <laughs> Leather, suede, satin and silk, rope, brass, cord, notched, cinched, buckled. It was a fashion statement, a utilitarian transport for tools and treasures, an object grown-ups could use to threaten children. It was a murder weapon, binding hands and feet or wrapped around the throat. A belt, a room, inside a room, behind a door, a man takes off his belt. That was her sentence. Wow. So there's a slight creep factor <laughs> to this story. And then McCorkle uses the word belt in so many sentences. Like I kept underlining a notch in his belt. She repeats, there was a man in a room behind a door. A man takes off his belt. And they end up at this inn in the country and come across a young girl is being fostered by the people who run the inn. There's a little dark thread in this book. Joe McCorkle is a master short story writer. If you haven't read her and you enjoy short stories, I highly recommend you get one of her collections. So I'm four for four in my four weeks of January so far. The other books I read was the novel Erasure by Percival Everett. Everett is one of the the writers that Russell recommended that we read when we talked about our top tens. He was a 2021 finalist for the Pulitzer for his novel Telephone. And in 2023, he was a Wyndham Campbell Award winner for fiction, which is an award given right down here at Yale, near where we live. And this novel is about Thelonious Ellison, who is a fiction writer that goes by the moniker Monk. And he is black and he writes very esoteric, kind of hard to read books that get published, but nobody really reads them. And he is teaching to make a living. His mother's getting older and needs his help. And there's a young woman who's written a very urban book. And the book has sold like wildfire and is very popular. So he decides kind of on a whim that he's going to sit down and write a book like that. Chapters of that book actually appear inside of this book. The book ends up selling to a publisher for a lot of money. They want to make it into a movie. It ends up winning the National Book Award, for which Monk happens to be a judge that year and can't believe this is happening. So it's a very meta novel. It's also very experiential. There's a lot of interesting things in it. It was a little bit hard to read, but I enjoyed reading it very much. I'm so glad I have a Percival Everett under my belt. The movie that's out right now called American Fiction is based on this novel, Erasure by Percival Everett. The other book I read that is about twice the size it should be <laughs> is called The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell. I spent the weekend at the gentleman caller's house because it was frigid temperatures here. I spent several hours in the bathtub <laughs> Falling asleep, apparently, and dropping my book in the bathtub. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I said, we're just going to clarify that it's not the writing that should be halved. <laughs> it's the pulpiness from being wet. <laughs> yes, I did put a video on our Instagram stories. I dropped this book not one day, but two days in a row <laughs> because I fell asleep. I was reading in the tub and fell asleep. Lovely novel. One of my reading resolutions this year is to continue to read Maggie O'Farrell. I was thrilled to find a copy of this 
paperback used when I was in Colorado. And it is the story of Lucretia di Cosimo de Medici, who married Alphonse, Duke of Ferrara. It takes place in the 1500s. O'Farrell was inspired by reading My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. And she came across the one and only portrait that was painted of Lucretia. Most portraits, she said, in that time period, people's faces are very stoic. But Lucretia's face had a little bit almost of a look of fear. And it caught her eye. And she knew that that was going to be the next novel she was going to write. It's historical fiction. You feel like you are there living Lucretia's very creepy life. Oh, jeez. Oh. <laughs> Hold on, I'm going to read. It's very hard to turn the pages when you've dropped a book in the bathtub. <laughs> it made it really hard to read this book. And it's still down. It's still <laughs> wet. And it was a week ago, or maybe five days. So the historical note at the very beginning of the novel says... In 1560, 15-year-old Lucretia de Cosimo de' Medici left Florence to begin her married life with Alfonso II, Duke of Ferrara. Less than a year later, she would be dead. The official cause of her death was given as putrid fever, but it was rumored that she had been murdered by her husband. What she does with this novel is the very beginning is kind of the end. It goes back and forth in time quite a bit, but the first chapter is titled A Wild and Lonely Place, Forteza near Bondano, 1561. This is the first paragraph. If you read this paragraph, you will want to continue. Lucretia is taking her seat at the long dining table, which is polished to a watery gleam and spread with dishes, inverted cups, a woven circlet of fur, her husband is sitting down, not in his customary place at the opposite end, but next to her, close enough that she could rest her head on his shoulder, should she wish. He is unfolding his napkin and straightening a knife, and moving the candle towards them both, when it comes to her with a peculiar clarity, as if some colored glass has been put in front of her eyes, or perhaps removed from them, that he intends to kill her. That's the first paragraph. Wow. <laughs> She's 16 years old when this is happening. So, oh, it's such a good book. The only complaint I have, and I feel like I want to stand on a platform, Chris, or a soapbox. I want to bring back the table of contents. Like, why do some books have a table of contents and some don't? Nonfiction usually does. But fiction often does, too. Does it? Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe I'm losing my mind. I don't know. I mean, story collections do. Definitely. Right? Yeah. It would be so helpful, you know, because yeah. I want to flip back to the front instead of having to go back to each chapter and go now, what year was that? Well, 19th century novels, for sure. In early 20th centuries, they did have a great table of contents where it would be the title of the chapter and then a little summary, like a sentence or two. So you could actually see what's coming ahead or go back and find your place or like you're saying, when was that? Where was that? Who was that? Could be answered possibly in that table of contents. Yeah, I mean, this book would have really benefited from it, or at least I would have been in front of because I liked her titles. I wanted to know where they were. And I kept flipping back, you know, to find the chapter. And I was like, oh, it would be so nice to just have a table of contents. Anyway, The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell. I will also say that at least the U.S. copies, the hardback had this portrait of Lucretia. This one has more of a wild scene with a tiger on it because there is a really cool scene with a tiger in the novel. Beautiful copy until I dropped it in the tub twice. <laughs> <laughs> she talked about that novel going and doing the research when we saw her in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Was that Manhattan or Brooklyn? Brooklyn. It was in Brooklyn. Yeah. And how when she went to the museum, or was it in a church? I don't remember now where her portrait is. And, and she was going and they were surprised that they asked about her, Lucretia, mm -hmm. because, oh, no one ever asks about her. They're always looking at the more glamorous members of that family that lived a little bit longer yeah yeah and that also her portrait is behind a fire extinguisher yeah and that she also went to her grave and put flowers on her grave and just sobbed feeling like she was really someone lost in history and so young so young and from such a powerful 
family that was into so much political intrigue. You just think like the poor kid was just a pawn. Yeah. And she was really smart. And it was actually her sister that was supposed to marry him, but she died unexpectedly. So they went to the next girl in line and Mm. it was her. And she was actually 12 at the time. And she had a nurse that told them she wasn't a woman enough yet and prevented her from being married off quite so early. But she was promised by Mm. the age of 12. Wow. And how old is her husband? Did they say? I don't remember. I don't think he was that old. You know, it wasn't like she was marrying into a 40 year old because his father had died recently, but he was definitely in his 20s, I think. Hmm. Don't quote me on that, but okay. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Wow. I want to read that one too. Yeah. The marriage portrait. You might want a different <laughs> copy than this one. This right. one's gotten a little heavy <laughs> and bloated. <laughs> So, Chris, did you have any exciting Biblio adventures? Yeah, I did. Um, I went to Illinois to visit my mom. I was there for, gosh, about 10 days. I did go out one night, and I went to the Barnes & Noble in a town called Naperville, Illinois, which everyone knows about if they live in Illinois, because it's one of those fancy, swanky towns with a lot of great shopping and restaurants. It's also a historic town. It's home to Anderson's Bookshop, which is a very well-known independent bookstore that has a lot of great events. But the Barnes & Noble in town, it's this big two-story anchor building on the main strip. It's closing. It's actually closed by now. January 21st was the date that it was going to close. So I went to pay my respects just because I had been there a bunch of times. And the first year I did NaNoWriMo, the National Novel Writing Month, I had met with a group of writers there. I just have fond memories of meeting and talking about writing and everything with those folks. And then another night, I did make it to the Frugal Muse bookstore. It's a used bookstore in a town called Darien, Illinois, which isn't too far from Naperville. And I just love that used bookstore so much. It's always well organized. They have books that are different. They don't take a lot of hugely popular stuff. Like you'll see some of the popular stuff on the shelf for sure. But they do a great job of keeping things well curated and well-rounded and interesting. I always find some gems there. So I did get some books that night. I was just going to browse I wasn't going to buy anything, but I couldn't help myself. Well, I can't wait because you posted a picture of bags and I wanted to see what <laughs> no, was inside of them. I posted the, them backwards. Oh, yeah. that's so funny. For yeah. some reason, I thought they were like paper bags. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, they. Ooh. well, you know what? It was dark and it was snowy. And then I just held the books up with their pages mm. out. So I think it all kind of looked. Yes. Teasing. Yeah. I can't wait. But I found, well, okay, this is what I bought. Hudson River Bracketed by Edith Wharton. This is a novel of hers, one of her later ones that came out in 1929. And I always want to call it Hudson River Rebracketed. <laughs> and I don't know if I'm thinking about Brides Had Revisited and getting the two confused, but it's Hudson River Bracketed. And it's a chunkster. It's over 500 pages, at least the edition that I have. So I'm thinking about that for Sue's Big Book Summer already. Mm even though I'm not planning my reading this year. (laughs) (laughs) There's a copy of Writing a Jewish Life. It's a memoir by Lev Raphael. That came out in 2006. And I read his memoir that came out after that called My Germany. I've read a couple of his novels as well. He's pretty prolific. Coincidentally, one of the novels of his I remember reading was, I think the title was The Edith Wharton Murders. So that's a neat connection. And that memoir is about his parents were Holocaust survivors. In this memoir, and he's written, I think, four or five memoirs total. This one is about him coming to terms with his faith and with his sexuality. So it's a fairly thin memoir. I look forward to reading that soon. And then the last book was one that I actually wanted to get at a book expo event that you and I went to years ago and they ran out of copies by the time I got to that booth. It's the Chancellor, the Remarkable Odyssey of Angela Merkel. There's a different pronunciation. I how does the, how do they say her name in German? Angela, I believe. And she was the Chancellor of Germany. This book came out in 2021. It's a biography by Katie Marton. 
you know, it's the biography of the Chancellor Merkel, who I was always interested in her because she seemed to be really no nonsense and has a PhD in like physics, but she had wanted to be a chemist. So how did she end up getting a PhD in physics? And then how did she ever get into politics? And then she was chancellor for a long time, like I think from 2005 to 2021, when this book came out, which is one of the reasons it came out, I think, because she was leaving office. So those are the three that I purchased at Frugal Muse. Thank you, Frugal Muse, for always having something that tempts me. <laughs> Lovely. So while Chris was in Illinois, I was in Colorado visiting my son and daughter-in-law. I went for my birthday, and my birthday gift was tickets to see Ann Patchett and Elizabeth McCracken in conversation as part of the Aspen Words Winter Festival. It was fabulous. I have to say I was a little nervous because sometimes when authors who are really good friends get together and talk, it can be a little bit inside baseball. But these two did not do that. And, you know, Ann Patchett owns Parnassus Books in Nashville. They host a lot of events. So I'm sure part of it is she knows the drill, like entertain the masses. <laughs> so they told their meet cute story, which was really fun. They met 34 years ago when they had both gotten seven month fellowships at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Mass., Anne arrived late after like the meet and greets. So she was in her hotel room talking to her boyfriend, telling him how lonely she was and scared kind of and nervous. And he said, I want you to hang up the phone from talking to me and go start knocking on doors. And I want you to go meet someone. And she was like, knock on doors. <laughs> and he said, yeah, hang up the phone, go knock on doors. And the first door she knocked on was Elizabeth McCracken. They became fast friends. They told the story about how it did take them a little while to be willing to read each other's work because they were afraid that they would read each other's work and discover that they were terrible writers and then they wouldn't want to be friends with them anymore because they said it's really hard to be friends with a writer who's a bad writer, which was really funny <laughs> and definitely plays like she's very high energy, very funny. And Elizabeth McCracken is like her dry straight woman putting in these little witty one word or two word comments. So funny. They were hilarious. They both talked about influences in their lives that have made them better readers. And Elizabeth McCracken teaches at a university down in Austin, Texas. And she said that definitely has made her more of an open, generous reader. And Anne said, owning a bookstore has made her a better reader that she was a literary fiction snob when she opened the bookstore. And then she went on about a 15 minute tangent about romance. And the importance of the romance genre. I'm going to actually quote her. She says that owning a bookstore has made her much more open minded, that romance readers are non binary. It's the most open minded section of the bookstore which I thought was really interesting. And she went on to describe the different kinds of people that come in and the kinds of books they're looking for. And she said, there's a store next door to her that she thinks is going to go out of business and she's going to take it over and she's going to open a romance only bookstore called love story, <laughs> which I think is awesome. The other thing she said is that her retired business partner was totally anti backlist. So when they opened the bookstore, they never had backlist. And now that she is retired, the first thing Anne did was start to bring in a ton of backlist. And if any of you follow Parnassus on Instagram, they do a Tuesday video with new releases and events coming up. And then they do a Friday video where Anne does backlist titles. And so she talks about that. I highly recommend you check that out. She also talked about book bans because two of her books just that week had been banned, Bel Canto and The Patron Saint of Liars. She mentioned how some authors are telling her how painful it is literally to their pocketbook to be banned. Authors like Jacqueline Woodson, you know, she said, even if her book isn't banned in a school system, librarians are afraid 
to bring them in because of the reaction that they'll get or trouble they might get into. So she's really noticing a dent in her book sales because of that. They talked about their writing styles and wrote Tom Lake. All right, ready listeners who loved Tom Lake. She wrote Tom Lake, all of it on a walking treadmill. 100%. Wow. And she revises as she goes. So she does not move on to the next chapter until she feels like the chapter is pretty much ready for her editor. Elizabeth McCracken, on the other hand, (laughs) this is hilarious. She said, I'm still sitting in the chair that I bought 34 years ago (laughs) for the Fine Arts Work Center Fellowship. And she said, I basically get a pound of cherries and a pound of pistachios (laughs) hunker down in my chair. And she said, it's even got like a thing that holds my head. And she writes and writes and writes and might write 150 pages to understand a character that she gets rid of all of the pages. So incredibly different writing styles, but they are each other's readers also still to this day. Elizabeth also calls herself very feral. (laughs) (laughs) I could see that. (laughs) The the other thing they did was they gave book recommendations and it was hilarious. Jacob and I were sitting almost in the last row. And as soon as they said they were going to give book recommendations, 50% of the audience whips out their phones. (laughs) And he was like, what just happened? And I said, this is how we book people are, Jacob. Like, And what was cool is they recommended current things and then backlists. So Elizabeth's recommendations, and these are all going to be in the show notes, everybody. You don't have to whip out your phone. (laughs) Is Night Wherever We Go by Tracy Rose Payton. This was one of my top tens in 2022. Leg, the story of a limb and the boy who grew from it by Greg Marshall. And that's a memoir about family, sexuality, disability, and more. He walked with a limp his whole life, and it wasn't until he was an adult that he realized his parents were hiding from him that he had cerebral palsy. Mrs. Caliban by Rachel Ingalls, and that was originally published in 1982. Anne's list was So Big by Edna Ferber, Mm, 1924. I've never read her. The Comfort of Crows by Margaret Rankle, which just recently came out. Martyr, a novel by Kaveh Akbar, which I believe just pubbed this week. James by Percival Everett. And This is Happiness by Niall Williams. It was a fantastic evening. We laughed and laughed. They are so funny. Great, great event. So all of my worries were assuaged. The other things I did in Carbondale were go to White River Books which is a beautiful little tiny independent bookstore. I had one of those, I feel like an idiot moment because I was there with Jacob and I was like, oh, look, there's Tom Lake. Oh, look, there's the hero of this book by Elizabeth McCracken. And then I kept going on and on. And I said, these are all the authors coming to the Aspen Words Festival. And the owner of the bookstore was like, yeah, that's (laughs) the table for the authors coming. Anyway, I felt... (laughs) Slow to the uptake there, (laughs) but beautiful little bookstore. And I bought Jacob a copy of The Last Ranger by Peter Heller, which reminds me that I read that, I think, as an arc. And just to remind people that book is out great if you're looking for a, a novel about wolves being released in Yosemite, run yourself to the bookstore. And then I also went to the Carbondale Public Library, and that's where I got that wonderful copy of The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell at their Friends of the Library sale, which they have a whole room devoted to. Lots of book stuff for my week in Carbondale. Awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when I was visiting mom, we watched a lot of movies because it was so cold. It was below zero. um, So we didn't go out very much. But one of the movies that we watched, she didn't know about, and I hadn't heard of it either until Laura introduced me to it, you know, 20 plus years ago when we first met. And it is The Princess Bride. This is a movie that's based on the novel by William Goldman. The movie is done by Rob Reiner. So you know it's done with a lot of heart. The story is a bit of a parody of fairy tales and rescue stories. But as I said, it's Rob Reiner, so it's done with a lot of heart. I don't know how the book was. On one of our road trips, Laura and I stopped at a used bookstore to get a copy of it, to read it while we're driving. And we found a little mass market copy. 
got in the car, got back on the road, and she opened it. And we were like, oh, my God, it smelled so bad that we ended up leaving it at a rest stop or something. Didn't get very far. So I don't know if I'm ever going to read it, but my mom loved the movie so much. So I wanted to just bring it up in case people haven't heard of it. Because when was that? The movie came out in the 80s at some time, later 80s, I think. So if you missed it, watch it because it is so much fun. It is about Wesley and Buttercup who are in love and Wesley has to go off to earn his money because he's just this poor farm boy. And, oh, you know what? I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything more other than watch it. It's a really good time. It's fun. It stars Carrie Elways. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Robin Wright, Mandy Patinkin, Peter Falk, Billy Crystal, Wallace Shawn. Like, you'll be surprised at some of the, the people that come up. It is just such good entertainment for the soul. It's a cult classic. I love that movie. And I know people who watch it every year. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like their Rocky Horror Picture Show movie, you know? Yeah. Oh, it's so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Well, I too watched a movie that was a book adaptation. That's one of my resolutions for the year that Jim and I will do that together. And we watched Boys in the Boat based on the novel by Daniel James Brown, The Boys in the Boat, Nine Americans and the Quest for Gold at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. I listened to this book a long time ago. Me you too. too. I'm waving my hand. Yes. Yes. Because the guy who plays the grandpa on Gilmore Girls yes. performed it. And he has such a great voice. Edward Herman. Yeah. yeah. He plays Lorelai's dad. Such a great character in the Gilmore Girls. Such a beautiful voice. And I feel like he made that book come alive because there's so many scenes where these guys are rowing and they're races. And I just remember times where I was driving, where I was white knuckling, you know, (laughs) listening to him. And one of the things that was sad for me in the movie is I kept wanting him to walk in, you know, (laughs) and like be one of the characters, but sadly he passed away. I thought it was a good adaptation. I thought the book was definitely better. There were more racing scenes in the book. And there's also a character that's really important. He's the boat builder. I don't know if you remember that. And befriends the young man who doesn't have much family that character was in the movie and was important, but wasn't as big a part of the movie as he was, I felt like, in the mm-hmm. book. But based on a true story, really exciting. I enjoyed the movie. And Jim, who had never read the book, really enjoyed the movie. Very good. Yeah, and it's out now in the theaters, but we did stream it via Amazon Prime, which we had to pay for. Mm. But. Okay. The other Biblio adventure I had was a Zoom event, and it was through Biography International Organization. It was their annual biography lab, which was really fantastic. It was a great event. The keynote was by Kai Bird, and that is available on YouTube. They recorded the different sessions, just the author speaking, not the Q&A, just to protect everyone's privacy. And I was super excited to hear Janice Nomura talk. She had a session about making a good story out of bad behavior and talking about bad behavior for an icon. She talked about Elizabeth Blackwell. She's the author of The Blackwell Sisters. And she was our guest on episode 139 talking about that book. It was one of our read-along selections in our year of reading nonfiction. And so she talked in this event about Elizabeth Blackwell, that there weren't adult biographies on the sisters. Most of the biographies she found were for kids. And she said she never liked kids biography as a kid because she's like, they're just so bloodless and they just skim the surface and make everything sound so rosy. So when she started really reading Elizabeth Blackwell's letters and realized how prickly she was and internalized a lot of misogyny and was anti-suffragist. She thought, oh, this is why people didn't want to write an adult biography of her because she's problematic. But that's what draws Janice to subjects. Because how are you going to learn, she says, if you're not challenged by people, if you're only going for people that you like 
what are we going to learn from history, right? Well, and sometimes those challenging people are the ones that make history, That's right? That's exactly what she said, is that it, it is, they're usually prickly and hard to deal with because they are doing things that are breaking molds and doing things beyond what most humans do. So they don't fit in very well. They don't have time to be nice, even some of them, you know, because they're busy doing their thing. So she talked several times about admiring her versus liking her and just considering that as biographers. Really great session. There was also a session by James McGrath Morris that was super interesting. He talked a lot about researching online beyond Google. So he talked about a lot of resources and then there was the third presentation was by Ray A. Shepard, and he talked about pacing and research and, and writing. He writes a lot for young adults and middle schoolers and had some really great ideas. He talked about thinking about your biography once you're working on the research. And he said, forgive me, a lot of my examples that I give were for eighth graders. But, he, you know, he's <laughs> like thinking about it as a cake pan. And you have all these different shapes for cake pans and what shape does yours need to be to bake properly. So I really enjoyed that. Really wonderful event. And if you haven't read The Doctor's Blackwell yet by Janice Nomura, we both highly recommend that. And a lot of our readers really love that and still bring it up in conversation. So upcoming jaunts, we have a joint jaunt that we're going to be going to on February 2nd. Yes, we're going to be going to Luann Rice's event at Bank Square Books. It is going to be all about her new novel, Last Night. Which Chris has read. I'm going to be reading it this coming weekend. Yes, very excited about that. It's her launch event because the novel officially comes out on February 1st. I think people who have Amazon read first pick or something were able to access it this month. Okay. Yeah. I also have another movie, a book to film adaptation. American Fiction is playing at Madison Art Cinema here in Madison, Connecticut. And it was just nominated for five Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Lead and Supporting Actor, Original Score, and adapted screenplay. So that's cool. That's based on Erasure by Percival Everett, which I just finished reading. Very cool. Nice. Well, another biblio adventure I have on the books is one that involves my wife, Laura. She's going to be reading from a work in progress. She has a novel she's working on. And that is going to be on February 11th at 5 p.m., part of the Chester Arts and Literary Weekend. So the whole weekend is February 9th to the 11th. Details are forthcoming about that. But we know for sure Laura's event will be part of three different writers, either reading from their works or doing solo shows. So Julie Fitzpatrick and Pat Lohr are the other writers that will be there. And there's going to be a short talk back afterwards. And what's really cool is that panel is going to be facilitated by Danny Howard, who's the new co-owner of Breakwater Books here in Guilford, Connecticut. I'm really looking forward to that. Congratulations to Laura. That's exciting. I didn't know she was working on a novel. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, she's actually working on two. But Overachiever. That's for her to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm super excited about that. You know, she's obviously done a lot of public things with her playwriting, but this will be the first time she's doing something with her fiction. Awesome. Yeah. So coming up next, woo, woo, we're celebrating 200, y'all. Yes, our 200th anniversary. Time is so fast when you're doing something you love. Indeed. So for those of you who already know the backstory, this will not be news to you. For those of you who are maybe newer to the podcast, Chris and I met because of a podcast that is now sunset called Books on the Nightstand. And this was a podcast done by Michael Kindness and Ann Kingman, who were Random House book reps. And it was a fantastic, fantastic podcast. I believe you can still you can still listen. Yeah, I'm not sure if they're still available on their website. But I think you can still find them on your podcast player. Yeah. One of the features that they had is two books we can't wait for you to read. 
That was their last segment on their podcast. We kind of emulated when we started podcasting by doing segments slightly different. But as an homage to them, because we would have never met had we not been Books on the Nightstand listeners, we decided that our last segment on episode 200 would be two books we can't wait for you to read. And we invited some guests to join in the fun. Yes. So we invited some of our past guests. We have a total of 16 guests on this episode, and they're each going to give you two books that they can't wait for you to read. Some people might have bent the rules a little bit. <clears throat> Bianca, we're not mentioning names. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, Emily and I are going to be sticking to the rules, and we both have two to share. And then we're going to turn it over to our guests. And before you panic, yes, this is a lot of books. Don't forget, if you go to bookcougars.com, every episode has show notes. And in those show notes are listed all of these books. Y'all, there are some great books. We are so excited by these books mentioned by our guests. Should I say the word books one more time? (laughs) Lots of books. Here we go. You want to go first? I just want to say one more thing about our show notes is that Emily always links the books, usually to bookshop.org. So when you go there, you can click on it and see what the book is about. Yes, just FYI. Yeah, people didn't give too much detail. What we asked for them to give was like a little elevator pitch. So if you're curious, if you want to pre order, the one thing we should say is because it's titled two books, we can't wait for you to read. These are books that are coming out. They're not books that are already published. So you can pre order them by following these links in the show notes, or tell your library about them. Absolutely. Yes. So the first book I'm going to tell you about that I can't wait for you to read is Imagination, a Manifesto by Ruha Benjamin. This book comes out February 6th from W.W. Norton and Company. It is part of their Norton Shorts series. Ruha Benjamin wrote one of my favorite books of 2023, Viral Justice. So Imagination is about imagination, imagining things that seem impossible and ridiculous, such as a world without prisons. The first book I'm excited to tell you about is How to End a Love Story by Yu Lin Kuang. Yu Lin works in the entertainment industry. As a matter of fact, she's been fired by Hallmark for being too hip. But she's back at it. She's currently adapting Emily Henry's book, People We Meet on Vacation, for the screen. And this is her debut. And it is a romance, which I'm excited about since we're focusing on romance here at the Book Cougars this year. And I think it's like a reboot of a romance that took place 13 years prior between Helen and Grant. One is a successful TV writer. So there's a little bit of a meta thread here, emulating Yulin's own life. I'm really excited about it. There's a lot of buzz around this novel. It comes out on April 2nd. I also want to say that it does have one of those cartoony covers that we talked about with romance author Sarah McLean when she was on an episode back in 2023. And we have put together a Goodreads thread within our Goodreads group about general romance thoughts and questions. And Sigrid recently wrote in and told us about a podcast episode on 99% Invisible. It was episode 444. And it's called The Clinch, which is what they call that classic romance novel cover where two people are embracing each other. And the episode talks about this move to having more cartoony covers on romance novels and suggests that the reason behind that is to get these books shelved in general fiction in bookstores in libraries, as opposed to being relegated to the romance sections. Really excited to listen to that episode. Thank you, Sigrid, for letting us know about it. And we will put a link to that in the show notes. Well, my second book is a memoir, Rift, a memoir of breaking away from Christian patriarchy by Kate West. And this one comes out April 30th from William B. Erdman's publishing company, which is an independent Christian slash religious publisher. They're new to me. I got this arc through NetGalley. 
And I'm really curious about it because Kate West was raised in a patriarchal Christian household, the type where the girls stay home and have to dress very modestly according to whatever dad tells them and how she broke away from that. Ooh, sounds very fascinating. Two nonfictions, Chris. Very cool. Oh, I didn't even realize that. Yeah. The other book I'm really excited about is the Paris novel by Ruth Reichel. Ruth Reichel mostly writes memoir and nonfiction. She was a restaurant reviewer. This is her second novel. It comes out on April 23rd. It takes place in the 1980s. The main protagonist, Stella, gets a one-way ticket to Paris. She happens upon a vintage clothing store where she buys a Dior dress, and she and the dress start to explore the art and food scene in Paris. She ends up living, Chris, above... Shakespeare and company in that apartment that they have there. It's called a feast for the senses with lots of food. And Reichel can write about food like no other. So again, that's called the Paris novel out April 23rd. All right, everybody. So coming up next are 16 guests with fantastic recommendations for you. All books coming out in the near future. Happy Happy reading. reading. Hey, Emily and Chris, it's Michael Kindness um, calling to congratulate you on 200 episodes of the Book Cougars, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this special episode. I'm going to share two books I can't wait for you and your listeners to read. Um, First up is Unclaimed by Pamela Prickett and Stephen Timmermans, and that comes out March 12th. It looks at the rising number of people who die and whose bodies are never claimed. Some don't have any family Some have family who can't afford, you know, like cremation or burial fees, and some are just unknown. The book looks at four different people in greater Los Angeles who all die and are not immediately claimed. We read about close friends who want to lay their loved ones to rest but can't because they're not related by blood. There's a group of veteran bikers who make sure their military brothers and sisters are never buried without someone to bear witness and honor them. And there's a woman who takes unclaimed, often unnamed infants, gives them a name, and lays them to rest in a beautiful and peaceful corner of a cemetery. Those are just some of the people that are covered in this book. There's a large group who are working, some together, some on their own, trying to give dignity to these people who have passed away. The numbers of unclaimed people are rising nationwide, and it's a symptom of the decreasing close relationships in our modern world. It seems like this book might be depressing, but ultimately it's hopeful because of all of the people that you meet who are working to connect and honor the dead. The second book is a novel coming out on June 11th. It's called The God of the Woods, and it's by Liz Moore, who some readers might remember from her most recent book, Long Bright River, which came out in early 2020. This book takes place in August of 1975, or it starts in August of 1975, I should say. It's a summer camp in the Adirondacks, and the camp and the land are owned by the wealthy Van Lahr family, whose large house is, you know, like uh, situated in one corner of the property, and the camp is in another area. 13-year-old Barbara Van Lahr has been forced by her parents to attend the camp, but one morning her bunk is found empty, and a frantic search begins. The family and the police feel like they're racing against time because 14 years earlier, the first Van Lahr child disappeared and was never found. So I feel like we need like a dun-dun-dun right there. Uh, this book jumps from the 60s to the 70s, um, from family members to campers and to the young female detective trying to prove herself to her male colleagues. It's twisty and a real page turner, almost 500 pages long, but I read it in one weekend. It's my favorite book of the year so far. So those are my two picks. Thanks again for asking me to take part in your celebration. And here's to many, many more episodes. Congratulations. Hi, Book Cougars. This is Ann Kingman. I'm currently a director of field sales for Penguin Random House Publisher Services, which is a division of Penguin Random House that distributes primarily small press and independent publishers. They're independently owned, but we use the bigger Penguin Random House sales and distribution team to help get these great, great independent presses and small presses get their books into the marketplace. Um, I specifically work with 
independent bookstores and the reps who sell to the independent bookstores. I am also the former host of Books on the Nightstand, and I'm a little rusty, so hopefully any of your listeners who did listen to Books on the Nightstand will understand that i um, a little out of practice here, but I do have two titles that I just absolutely can't wait for you to read. I have more, but I had to pick two. You're so mean for making me choose, but I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to talk about these two books. First book I want to tell you about today is Service by Sarah Gilmartin, which will be published in June from Pushkin Press. Some of you may know Sarah Gilmartin from her earlier novel, Dinner Party, which was a huge favorite at indie booksellers. And I think Service is even better. Service is due to come out in June. And what drew me to the book was that it's set in the restaurant industry. But what blew me away was the writing and the storytelling and the fact that this novel is told in three very distinct voices, all of whom are incredibly strong and interesting and really change your perspective on the book. So I'll just give you a a, a quick synopsis without having to go too deep into the plot. One of our main characters is Hannah, who was formerly a waitress at a very upscale Dublin restaurant, Dublin, Ireland. She worked for this very renowned, famous, top-of-his-game chef named Daniel. And Hannah learns that there is a sexual assault accusation against Daniel. And she starts to think of her past and her interactions with Daniel and other members of the restaurant as she was working in this restaurant. The second voice is Daniel himself, and you hear his confusion and his outrage and his sense of persecution, and you kind of get into his head as he's dealing with these sexual assault allegations and how he handles it within his life and his memories. And then the third voice, and and this is the one that I found the most compelling, is Julie, who's Daniel's wife. And we don't very often read or hear about the perspective of the accused wife. But in this case, we're, we're right there with Julie as she's wrestling with these allegations. The novel, it's propulsive. I could not put it down. I loved the restaurant setting. If you're a fan of Sweet Bitter, either the book or the TV show, you will find much to love here. You very much get the inner workings of the restaurant but also you get the inner workings of these characters' minds. It's one of those books that I have not been able to forget about or stop thinking about since I read it, and I think it's very strong, and I hope that you all take a look and consider reading it. The second book I can't wait for you to read is The Bog Wife by Kay Cronister. It comes out in October from Counterpoint, and it is stunning. And this is one, I don't know, I I really can't wait for people to read this, mainly because I want to talk to people about this. Service is a good book club book, but this Bog Wife, I I think you almost have to have a mandatory book club to read it, because you'll want to talk about it with somebody. I would call it an Appalachian Gothic. It also really reminded me of Shirley Jackson's We've Always Lived in the Castle. Reminded me of The Water Cure by Sophie McIntosh, if any of you have read that. And then a little bit of The Virgin Suicides, too. So hopefully that sets you up for what this is. It's ultimately about this family of five siblings who live in a dilapidated old mansion in West Virginia that is on the edge of the bogs. And the family throughout history had made a bargain with the bog, basically, that the bog would provide for the family if the family took care of the bog. And it was this pact, this compact that went back generations upon generations. And the Hattesley family, which is now a father and five children, are wrestling with this compact. The father, the patriarch, is on his deathbed. And the family has made this bargain with the bog that once the patriarch dies the oldest born son will go out into the bog and a wife will be waiting for him in the bog. And by waiting for him, I mean, will be created from the bog, from the plant matter and the peat and the the natural materials that are in the bog. So yes, there's a little bit of some might call it supernatural or occult or horror, but it's kind of just a given in the book. 
so the family is wrestling with this. There are a number of things happening in this family and in the world that make it possible that this compact will not be able to be fulfilled. And so each of the family members is kind of dealing with this in their own way. And I know I'm not being very straightforward and I'm tap dancing around it a lot because I'll tell you my experience in this book was I never really knew where it was going. And I kind of liked that feeling. And so every time there was kind of a reveal it turned the book into something else for me completely. And that's also why I really want to talk to somebody about it. I think it's one of those books that, yes, you have to sort of suspend your disbelief a little bit when you read and you have to just put yourself in the hands of the author who is Kay Cronister. You just have to trust her. You have to trust that she will take you along for a very, very satisfying journey. And that's exactly what this book is. But again, not completely because I need to talk to somebody about it. And I don't know anyone else yet who has read it. So if somebody manages to get an early copy, please call me because I, I really do need to talk about it with somebody. So it's The Bog Wife by Kate Cronister. The first book I talked about was Service by Sarah Gill Martin. Those are two books that I can't wait for you to read. Happy 200th episode, Book Cougars. I'm absolutely thrilled that you've been able to do this and sustain it. I know how much hard work goes into it, and you do a fantastic job. And thank you for inviting me to babble on about these two books. Thanks. We also invited authors to tell us about two books they can't wait for us to read and encourage them to mention their own if they have one coming out in 2024. The show notes list all of the authors with a link to their website if you want to learn more about them and their full list of books. Up first is Amy Tector. Thank you so much, Chris and Emily. I really appreciate this chance to come on the podcast. There's nothing I like more than talking about books. I'm so excited to recommend two books that I can't wait to read this year. One of the books I'm most looking forward is the latest Jackson Brody murder mystery from my favorite author, Kate Atkinson. Um, This one is called Death at the Sign of the Rook, and I think it's coming out in September. I love Atkinson's mysteries, which are rich in character, humor, and intricate plots. This one in particular, I hope, is really going to hit my sweet spot because the complex, competent, and fascinating private detective, Jackson Brody, finds himself in another one of my favorite tropes, an Agatha Christie-like setting, an English country manor house in a snowstorm. And of course murder is afoot. Uh, So I'm very, very excited in the fall to immerse myself in a world of vicars and army majors and dowagers, while once again trying to work out Atkinson's insanely intricate plots right alongside my beloved Jackson Brody. The second book I'm super excited about in 2024 is my own. So this is shameless plug time, but Honor the Dead is the third of my Dominion Archives uh, mystery series. Though I promise you don't have to have read the first two to jump right in at Honor the Dead. In this one, my protagonist, Dr. Kate Spencer, who's a highly competent coroner, but kind of a failure in life, (laughs) has retreated to the countryside to nurse her wounds while she waits to be reinstated as a coroner back in the city of Ottawa. She's biding her time and working as a general practitioner for the local community, but is really missing the satisfaction of investigating unexplained deaths. So luckily for her, although unluckily for the victim, she's soon embroiled in another murder case. A man is shot through the eye with deadly accuracy, and he's found in an apple orchard with a metal detector by his side. So while Kate is trying to unravel what happened, uh, she navigates family betrayal, deadly secrets, and the hunt for a mysterious lost treasure. I'm really, really proud of this book, which is set in my own native eastern townships of Quebec, which many readers around the world now know as Louise Penny country, but it's where I grew up. And I really loved writing about the place and the people that I grew up around. It was a really special project for me. And I'm also super proud of the ending of this book, which <laughs> I really think I nailed. I think I got a really good, exciting ending, and I'm, I'm so excited for readers to take a look and hopefully enjoy it. So that's Honor the Dead, and that will be out in April of this year. Oh, and in the book, I introduce a dog character, and he's wonderful, and no harm comes to him. But if you like dogs and literature, you, you might enjoy this guy. Thanks very much. Bye. Hi, Emily and Chris. 
I'm Andrea Wang, and I'm an author of books for young readers. I'm really looking forward to people reading my upcoming middle grade novel, Summer at Squee. It's about a Chinese American girl named Feeny Fong and the summer camp that she considers her happy place, the summertime Chinese culture, wellness, and enrichment experience, otherwise known as Squee. It's Feeny's last summer at Squee before she ages out, and she's determined to make it spectacular. So when she arrives at camp, she discovers that there's an influx of new campers, and not all of them are as into celebrating their Chinese heritage and culture as Feeny is. It's a book about navigating new friendships, a first crush, and exploring what it means to be Chinese American, with all the hijinks and drama of summer camp, too. The second book I'm excited for people to read is Debbie Fong's debut graphic novel titled Next Stop. It's about Pia, a middle schooler who is struggling with the loss of her younger brother and the impact it has had on her family. She embarks on a bus tour which ends at a mysterious underground lake that supposedly has magical powers. Pia makes friends with the other people on the bus but has a hard time admitting that she hopes the lake can heal her family. I read an advanced copy of the book and loved how it explores grief while also taking readers on a road trip through the wacky roadside attractions of Midwestern America. Next Stop comes out on March 19th, 2024, and my book Summer at Squee comes out on March 5th, 2024. Thanks so much. Hi there, I'm Bianca Murray and I'm the author of three novels, The Witches of Moonshine Manor, Hum If You Don't Know The Words, and If You Want To Make God Laugh. I've also got an Audible original two-hour short story out called The Prin Viper, and I'm a co-host on the popular podcast, The Shit No One Tells You About Writing. Now, books that I'm excited for you to read this year include The Husbands by Holly Gramazio, in which a woman returns to her flat to find a husband there. Just one problem. It's one she didn't have when she left. It seems he came down through the attic after changing a light bulb. And after she sends him back, a different husband comes down. And so it goes. So it's a really funny, thought-provoking read that'll have you turning the pages. That one comes out in April. The next one I'm looking forward to is Stephen Rowley's latest Gunkle book, The Gunkle Abroad, where gay Uncle Patrick reunites with his niece and nephew in Europe. Now, I haven't read this one, but I know it's going to be amazing. It comes out in May. The next one I'm looking forward to is Claire Lombardo's sophomore novel, Same As It Ever Was. She wrote The Most Fun We Ever Had, which came out in 2019 and remains one of my all-time favorite books. Now, full disclosure, I have no idea what Same As It Ever Was is about. I don't care. Just take my money. It is Claire Lombardo. It's coming out in June. I'm counting the sleeps. And then finally, Weird Black Girls by Elwyn Cotman. It's an unnerving collection of short stories that explore the anxieties of living while black, a high wire act of literary, fantastical hybrid fiction. And that comes out in April. Hi, I'm New York Times bestselling author Caroline Levitt, and I have two books I absolutely can't wait for you to read in the new year. The first is Splinters by Leslie Jameson, which is coming out February 20th. Jameson takes us inside her marriage as it fractures into divorce, even as she explores what it means to be a mom and how the undying power of love and art helped her to find herself in the process. It's really such a stunner. So my next book is actually mine. Days of Wonder. It's coming April 23rd. Based on the story of a real life friend of mine, Days of Wonder is about a young troubled woman, early released from prison, struggling to reinvent herself as she searches for the child she was forced to give up and grapples with the mystery of an attempted murder she and her now vanished boyfriend supposedly committed when they were 15. An attempted murder neither one of them can remember. I hope you'll love all my characters as much as I do, and I hope you'll pre-order the book. That would be just spectacular. Thank you, listeners and readers, and thank you, book cougars, Chris Willock and Emily Fine. Hello, book cougars. This is Davina from Book Browse. 
Book Browse provides a highly curated resource of recommendations for book club members and those who read to expand their horizons. And I'd like to recommend two books that our members have been reviewing recently for our early reader program, First Impressions. We've run, oh, about 800 of these programs where we share free books with members in return for writing an honest review. And because of the way the books are assigned, it's effectively impossible for the reviews to be skewed by people connected with the book in the way that mm, might happen in other places. These two books are getting glowing reviews that put them in the top 5%, actually probably more like top 3% of all the First Impressions books that we've shared to date. The first is Becoming Madam Secretary by Stephanie Dre, which publishes mid-March. It's about Frances Perkins, an extraordinary woman. She was born in 1880 into a working-class family, and by 1910, she was a workers' rights lobbyist in New York State. And that was 10 years before US women even had the right to vote, which is quite a thought. She was a significant influence to FDR from the time he entered politics, and not only was she the first woman ever to serve in a presidential cabinet, she was one of only two people to serve for all 12 years of FDR's presidency, and she was his Secretary of Labour. And in that capacity, she was the driving force behind the New Deal and Social Security. Wow, what a woman. It's a great book. The second book is... Daughters of the Shangdong, which publishes early May. It's written by Eve J. Chung. She's a Taiwanese-American human rights lawyer, and it's her debut novel. It opens at the start of the Chinese Civil War and is based on her own family story. Here's one of the First Impressions reviews written by Laurie B. in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm a long-time avid reader and rarely find a book that I would rate five stars. This is one. Eve Chung has done a wonderful job of telling an historically-based family story during the tumultuous events in China from the 1940s through 60s. The extreme challenges of women, their resilience and fortitude are portrayed in a realistic way. Chung's writing is descriptive without being overly expansive. Daughters of a Shandong was a real pleasure to read. If you'd like to read more reviews, just drop by BookBrowse any time. We're at bookbrowse.com. Thanks, Emily and Chris, for all that you do for us avid readers. And congratulations on your 200th episode. That's quite a thing. Hi, I'm Fiona Davis, author of The Spectacular, and I have two great books to be on the lookout for in 2024. First up is Anna Bright is Hiding Something by Susie Orman Schnall. If you love The Dropout, about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, you'll love Anna Bright. It's told from the point of view of a tech journalist and also that of a female founder who's full of secrets, and it's riveting and a really great read, and it comes out June 4th. The other book I have to give a shout-out to is A Novel Summer by Jamie Brenner. I've devoured everything she's ever written, and this comes out on July 16th, which makes it the perfect beach read. It tells the story of a writer named Shelby who writes a very successful book set in Cape Cod's province town that ends up infuriating all the residents. <laughs> and Jamie's books are really, they're just deeply human, and they always make me cry in the best of ways. And I hope you enjoy them both. This is Hank Bellafie Ryan, and I'm calling from Boston. My new book is a twisty, turny, psychological thriller called One Wrong Word. Someone asked me to describe it in five phrases. So, okay, I'll go for that. Five phrases for one wrong word. A crisis management expert with a crisis of her own. A shocking and salacious rumor. A controversial jury verdict. A gorgeous brownstone on Beacon Hill and the devastating power of public opinion. Two strong women face off in a high-stakes psychological cat-and-mouse game to prove their truth about a devastating betrayal. But which character is the cat, and which character is the mouse? Rumors, betrayal, empowerment, revenge, and justice. One wrong word can ruin your life. One wrong word can also fix it. One wrong word comes out February 6th. You need to know about Kara Hunter. Kara Hunter is a massive bestseller in the UK and is just coming to the United States. Her first US release, which made the Times list, was the incredible, almost interactive standalone Murder in the Family. It's a multimedia tour de force of a crime thriller, not to be missed. The structure alone is worthy of a standing ovation. 
So I loved it so much, I looked up her backlist and found that her mystery series is set in Oxford and starring D.I. Adam Folly, and it's about to be released in the U.S. So I snapped up the first one called Close to Home. I devoured it and then started book two called In the Dark. It's an ensemble cast with terrific characters and a riveting mystery and gorgeously written. So start with Kara Hunter's Murder in the Family, then head right over to her D.I. Adam Folly mysteries. Then let me know what you think. Hi, it's Jennifer Saverin Kelly, the author of End Papers, which came out in February 2023. And two of the many books I am looking forward to in 2024 are a debut memoir by Zoe Bossier, which I had the honor of reading an advanced copy of. And this memoir is a really gripping part coming of age and absolute unraveling of gender that takes place in the Arizona desert trailer park where Bassier grew up. In Cactus Country, suicide, drugs, violence were all part of Bassier's childhood, but also were love and acceptance. As Bassier grows up into a young adult and sort of discovers who they are, it's really a story about not just surviving, but also thriving. So highly, highly recommend Cactus Country by Zoe Bassier. The second book that I'm really excited for people to read, including myself, is a novel that I haven't actually read yet, but it's by one of my favorite authors, Lisa Ko, who wrote The Leavers that came out a number of years ago by Algonquin and quickly became one of my favorite books. Lisa Ko is coming out with a new novel called Memory Peace, and it looks like it's about three teenagers who are drawn together by a shared sense of wanting life to be different, seeing themselves as artistic collaborators. And it sounds like as they strive to build satisfying lives, it turns out that the world is radically different from the one that they were promised. And so it sounds like a really interesting premise. Cannot wait to get my hands on a copy. So that is Lisa Coe's memory piece and Zoe Bossier's Cactus Country. Hello, book cougars, and happy episode 200. Jenna Miller here, author of Out of Character and We Got the Beat, which is out February 20th. It features Jordan, a high school journalist who's tasked with covering the volleyball beat. Not only is she not sporty, but she has to spend the semester with her friend turned nemesis Mackenzie, who's also the captain of the volleyball team. Will time together make things worse or spark something new? You'll have to read to find out. Another book I'm really excited about this year is Dear Wendy by debut author Anne Zhao, out April 16th. It's about Sophie and Joe, two aromantic and asexual college students who engage in an online feud while unknowingly becoming friends in real life. I can't wait to read it and find out what happens when their two worlds collide. Happy reading, everyone. Hi, I'm Rachel Barenbaum, author of the novel Atomic Anna and host of the literary show Check This Out on NHPR. Congratulations to Chris and Emily on your 200th episode. I'm so excited for Book Cougars and I'm a huge fan. And I'm here today to recommend a book by one of my favorite new debut authors, Casey LeBlanc. His book Flyboy comes out in May and you should not miss it. It is magical and emotional and you're just going to love it. Flyboy is a young adult novel novel about a closeted trans boy who's going into his senior year at a new Catholic school and he starts dreaming about being a trapeze artist and then the dream becomes real and he joins this magical circus where he's seen for the boy that he truly is. It's coming of age, it's coming out, it's absolutely beautiful. Don't miss it. It's publishing in May. That's Flyboy by Casey LeBlanc. Thank you so much again for having me, Chris and Emily. Congrats. Hi, this is Kelsey Ervick, and I am the author and illustrator of the graphic memoir, The Keeper, Soccer, Me, and the Law That Changed Women's Lives, which is about growing up in girls' sports in the early years of Title IX, and then like looking back and learning about all of the athletes and activists who paved the way for me to have all of those experiences. And so looking ahead this year, two books that I'm really excited about also have to do with powerful women in history and doing cool things. They're also both graphic novels done by amazing author illustrators who are also amazing women. The first one is called My Favorite Thing is Monsters Book Two, 
by Emil Ferris. And the second one is called Victory Parade by Leela Corman. And both of them have historical figures of women doing amazing things in World War II. One is even in the world of professional women wrestling. And uh, again, both just have amazing artwork and storytelling. And I hope you'll check them out. Hi, this is Luann Rice. Congratulations, Book Cougars, on your 200th episode. That's really fantastic. I and so many other readers have loved them all and are looking forward to the next 200. Thank you for all that support that you have given me and so many other writers and for letting me mention my new novel, Last Night, which is a thriller that takes place at the Ocean House in Watch Hill, Rhode Island, during a blizzard. It's about two sisters and a missing child and a murder. It brings back several characters from my last couple of books. I also have a young adult novel coming out this year in September. It's called If Anything Happens to Me, and it's from Scholastic, and it is suspense as well. I'm looking forward to reading Juliet Grames' new book, The Lost Boy of Santa Keonia, It comes out in July, and it's about a young American teacher who goes to Calabria to open a nursery school in a very remote mountain village. While she is there, a flood uncovers a human skeleton. She becomes involved in the investigation because an old woman in the village is convinced it's her long-lost son. So I know that Juliet will just do something so wonderful. She's such a good writer. Congratulations again, and thank you for all the wonderful, wonderful episodes. Hi, everyone. This is Jung Yun, and I'm the author of two novels, Oh Beautiful and Shelter. And two of the many upcoming releases that I'm really excited about are actually a pair of sophomore novels. The first is Memory Piece by Lisa Ko, author of The Leavers. And this one is about three Chinese American women from adolescence through adulthood as they make their way in the world as artists and activists. And it also features a glimpse of the phenomenally talented Ko's vision of what the year 2040 will look like. That one comes out in March of 2024 from Riverhead. And the second is Bear by Julia Phillips, author of Disappearing Earth. This one is about sisters living on an island off the coast of Washington, and it features, you guessed it, uh, a bear that suddenly appears and, and creates havoc. It sounds a little spooky and mystical and magical, and if you read Phillips's debut, then you know how well she conjures a sense of place and menace. That one is coming out in June from Hogarth. So there you have it, uh, two books that I'm excited about in the year of 2024. I can't believe it, 2024 already. There are so many great titles coming out. I think it's going to be a fantastic year for reading. Thanks, everybody. Hello, Book Cougars. This is your mystery man, John Valeri, calling in to congratulate you on your 200th episode milestone and to wish you the very best of luck as you embark on the next 200. It's been my great privilege to chat books with you, and I thank you for the opportunity. And speaking of books, there are so many to look forward to in the year ahead. Here are two I'm particularly excited about. In April, Robert Dagoni releases A Killing on the Hill, a historical thriller about a young reporter looking to break the story of a former prizefighter's death at the hands of a mobster who claims the shooting was self-defense. The book is a fictionalized version of a true crime, which seems to be a growing trend right now, and Dugoni, who is both a journalist and lawyer before becoming a full-time novelist, will no doubt bring an inspired and illuminating viewpoint along with his stellar storytelling skills. Then in June, Meg Gardner returns with the fourth book in her chilling unsub series, Shadow Heart. FBI Special Agent Caitlin Hendricks takes on a case in which two serial killers appear to be in competition with one another, the first incarcerated for his crimes, while the second remains free, leaving fresh bodies at the old killing grounds. It takes a lot to scare me, but there have been at least a handful of truly unsettling scenes in each of the previous books. I expect nothing less this time, and I'm kind of looking forward to it, which I'm sure says something about me. And finally, in true Mystery Man fashion, I offer you a teaser that comes without a title, without a summary, and without a pub date. Marsha Clark, 
who you all know I love, is set to break new ground with her next release, expected in late 2024. The book has yet to be officially announced, but what I can tell you is that it's unlike anything she's done before and draws on the entirety of her career in the law, her life as a truth seeker, and her experiences as a woman who found herself unexpectedly thrust into the spotlight. You may wonder how I know all this, and someday I'll be able to tell you. Until then, onward. And kudos, Emily and Chris. Our reading lives are better because of you. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again with another episode in two weeks. Until then, come chat with us on social media, Goodreads, or email us at bookcougars at gmail.com. If you'd like to help support our podcast, please tell others about us, leave a review wherever you listen, and consider becoming a patron. Even a dollar a month is a big help. Learn more about that on our website, bookcougars.com, where you'll find the show notes for this and all of our past episodes. Thanks, everybody. This episode was edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design.